Welcome to Intergenerational Politics, a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Shi, a freshman at UCLA and the youngest elected delegate for Joe Biden. And I'm Jill Wine-Banks, the author of The Watergate Girl, an MSNBC uh, legal analyst and a wearer of Jill's pins. And today's pin is in special honor of our guest, Susan Page. It is a um, old-fashioned newsboy, because I think of Susan, although she's a wonderful author, but I think of her primarily as a newspaper woman. So uh, we're very fortunate to have um, Susan with us today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about her second book, Madam Speaker, which Victor is holding up a copy of so that you can all see it and go and buy it. Uh, Madam Speaker, Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power. Anyone who has come across Nancy Pelosi, whether Republican or Democrat, will tell you that she's a trailblazer, master negotiator, and a powerful force in Washington, D.C. The first woman elected Speaker of the House of Representatives, Nancy, broke a glass ceiling and in that role has advanced historic legislation, including the Affordable Care Act and the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, guaranteeing equal pay for women. But beyond her legislative acumen and the past she's paved for future generations of women, there's so much more to know about Nancy Pelosi's life and her approach to her job. And before we talk to Susan about Nancy Pelosi, I want you all to know more about her. Um, Madam Speaker is her second biography. Her first was about former First Lady Barbara Bush and was titled The Matriarch, a wonderful book. She was the first woman elected president of the Gridiron Club. And uh, it's the oldest association of journalists in Washington, which during my time in Washington refused to allow any female members, let alone having a president who was a woman. She also was president of the White House Correspondents Association in 2000 has served as chairman of the Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Awards and has twice been a juror for the Pulitzer Prizes. And she has won many awards for her work, including the Gerald R. Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency and the Sigma Delta Chi Distinguished Service Award for Washington Correspondence. Um, She's a graduate of Northwestern and of Columbia. I live near North. Northwestern, and I'm a graduate of Columbia, but she's of the journalism school. I was of the law school because I took the law boards instead of the graduate record exams. And as I was graduating, I wanted to go to Columbia, but it had to be the law school because that's the test I took. There's a lot to learn about Speaker Pelosi and about Susan. So thank you for joining us today. Hey, Jill, it's so great to be with you. I'm honored to be here on your podcast. Thank you. We are so looking forward to this. And, you know, I'd like to start about uh, start off with your book um, about Speaker Pelosi. Um, I've always been a huge fan about biographies and kind of how they're structured. And I want to ask you first, what led you to pick uh, Speaker Pelosi as your subject for the book? You know, for both the books I did, I had a couple of things in mind. I wanted to choose someone who made a difference, who was consequential, who had had an impact on our country. And I wanted to choose someone who people didn't really understand, maybe someone who'd been underestimated or misunderstood uh, during their time in the public eye. And I thought she fit both those criteria. Um, both, In fact, bo- both these women who I've, who I've written biographies of were turned out to be fascinating and complicated. I also, there was a, maybe a third thing I was looking for, someone who was a little controversial, <laughs> someone who had both fans and critics. And that is certainly the case when you talk about Nancy Pelosi. Oh, definitely. And, you know, she cooperated with her writing. You interviewed her, I think, 10 times, you said. And I'm wondering, what was that first interview like with her? Um, Because you were, you know, you you were with the USA Today, and I'm assuming that you have interviewed her before. But what was that first sit down interview like when you approached her and said, you know, I'm writing this book, you know, talk to me? (laughs) I had interviewed Nancy Pelosi over the years uh, as a reporter for USA Today. Uh, And the first, but when I signed a contract to write this biography, I had not made any arrangement with with her about whether she would talk to me. And that sounds really stupid, but here was my reasoning. My reasoning was I didn't want to feel like it was up to her whether I wrote this book. I didn't want her to feel like if she agreed to cooperate, she would have some say over what I wrote because I wanted to do a work of journalism, not an authorized biography. So she agreed to one interview uh, and I go in to see her and she offers me a dove bar. Uh, You know, she's a big chocoholic. So she offered me this uh, ice cream bar encased in chocolate. And I take a bite of it and I shatter little pieces of chocolate all over her carpet. Uh, 
all this pristine off cream colored carpet in the speaker's uh, in the speaker's office. So there I am with the speaker of the house, desperately trying to pick up little melting pieces of chocolate <laughs> off her carpet. I was sure she would never invite me back. Now she did let me come back and interview her. I interviewed her, as you said, a total of 10 times, but I can tell you, she never again offered me any food. <laughs> uh, that, that's a wonderful a great sto- story. Yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely a great first impression. I think that if I, if I were in that situation, I would not know what to do, especially with Speaker Pelosi. But I mean, what kind of relationship did you come to develop with her? Um, you know, as the interviews went on, did she get a little bit more relaxed with you? How did those nine other interviews go? So she's, she's a tough interview. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is guarded and she's very disciplined you know from doing this podcast you really prefer people who are undisciplined and will answer whatever question you ask she's not like that she's not embarrassed to say the same thing she has said a hundred times before if you ask her a question uh, so she she is a tough interview but by the time we got to the end of this process she was a, she was more relaxed she was more open than she was at the beginning and you know one thing you, i would say uh, th- that I really admire about Nancy Pelosi. She never put a single thing off the record. Uh, she she didn't always tell me every single thing she was thinking about, whatever I was asking about, but she never put anything off the record. She continued to sit down with me to talk, even though she knew I was asking questions, uh, some questions that she wanted to answer, but also some questions that she didn't want to answer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, from watching public speaker policy on TV, I always imagined her to be quite intense, yet almost humorous. Would you say that she, that that was kind of what it was like uh, in one-on-one interviews with her? So she's always intense, I think. I think that's just her persona. She is very, uh, she's powerful. She's comfort with power. She likes power. Mm-hmm. Uh, she exudes power. Um, she she's, tends to be an intense person. I wouldn't say she's humorless. Uh, she it's, it's not that she cracks jokes. I don't know that I've ever seen her crack a joke, but um, she is very devoted to her five children. She, you know, she didn't get she didn't get into politics until the youngest child was a senior in high school. She adores her nine grandchildren. She once, when she was seventy six years old, she took two of her grandsons to a Metallica concert. That is maybe a side of Nancy Pelosi you haven't seen. Yeah, definitely not. No, and you know you mentioned that you so you interviewed um, First Lady Barbara Bush, and that was your first biography um, biography book. Was that similar? Was can you kind of describe the comparison between interviewing First Lady Barbara Bush and then also Speaker Pelosi, and kind of what you learned in between those two processes of writing that book? They were t- totally different, and they were opposite challenges in doing biographies with Barbara Bush. If you ask her any question, she would answer it, even if it was embarrassing or to her or and she was, you know, she was funny and caustic. Um, But the challenge in doing the Barbara Bush biography was exploring the ways in which she had made a difference in policy with her when her husband was president, when her son was president, because she was influential on policy. But that was not something she talk about any personal question she was fine answering uh so that was the challenge with her the challenge was to reverse with nancy pelosi nancy pelosi would talk about the affordable care act uh or you know the details of policy or legislative debate um from morning noon and night but ask her something personal and she does not want to respond so the challenge with her was exploring kind of her more personal side at the very beginning of your book you you mentioned this story of you asking her if you can get a copy of her transcripts. And and she immediately was like, no. And it was like, I think at that moment, as, as the reader, we realize that she's probably a little bit off limits in terms of her personal life. But you still, you know, you also mentioned that you brought in drawings and different artifacts into each interview, which I guess you were trying to like pull pull in the personal side of Speaker Pelosi. And you mentioned that you brought in um, one of her mother's drawings that she submitted to the uh, U.S. Patent Office for a device that she had invented for uh, steam facials. What was her reaction to seeing some of those drawings and other memorabilia because it was so personal? I, th- I think it definitely helped our relationship. I think it. she thought it was interesting. You know, I think it also showed her that I was trying to be very serious about exploring her life in a serious in a serious way. These drawings from the patent office, quite elaborate, very scientific looking uh, for this device that her mother had invented. And in fact, 
last year, one of my sons went on eBay and found one of these machines that her mother had made. It has a little tag on it that says Nancy D'Alessandro's Beauty by Vapor. And uh, it comes with an electric cord. And you pour precious oils or as it might be happen water into this aluminum tube, plug it in, it creates steam that comes out through this hole. And Nancy D'Alessandro's promise to buyers was that it would give you beautiful, youthful skin. So um, I brought in, I, Nancy Pelosi had seen her mother's machine, but I don't think she had seen the patent that her mother had submitted for it. So that was new. And so I found some other things that she hadn't seen before. Uh, Jack Murtha, for instance, the, the, the congressman from the Pittsburgh area, who was a big, important ally of Nancy Pelosi when she got to Congress and in, in the early days of her trying to get to the leadership, he had some papers that he he's uh, passed away now, but he had some papers that he had uh, put in the archives at the University of Pittsburgh. I, I don't think anybody had ever gone through them. And, and then were these handwritten notes about what he thought of Nancy Pelosi. And I know that she had never seen those though because before, because I don't think anyone had ever found these papers before. Um, and she was very, I think she was very touched by those and she asked to keep a copy of them. Uh -huh. That is very nice. It's, I, I want to pursue a little more about writing a biography because you know, I wrote a memoir, but I started with my memories and then I fact checked them online and I interviewed some people involved. But to me, that seems a lot easier than trying to write a biography, uh, a particularly a biography about a living person who is so influential and so controversial and who probably overlaps in your other job as a um, bureau chief for a newspaper. So can you talk a little bit about the process of how you start to write a biography? So, and I enjoyed your book very much, The Watergate Girl. I'm glad that you wrote that. I hope, I think that when people have been at big events and played a part in them, it's so important for them to put it down on paper for history. So I'm, thank you for writing. Thank you for writing that book. And thank you for writing a little blurb for it. <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I, did. I, was, I was honored to write a blurb for it. I remember um, yours so well from the email you sent, which was, I'm trapped at an airport. <laughs> You're saving me. So yeah. that, was, that was the best. So true. Um, so what I did was, I don't know what the right way is to write a biography, but I can tell you the way that I did it, which was mm -hmm. I started out by making a list of a hundred people I wanted to interview. And then I interviewed the oldest people first because, you know, realities of life, people yes. get older, they get more forgetful. Sometimes they pass away. So I interviewed by birth date to start with for the people that I really wanted to talk to. So the first two people I was really focused on getting interviews with one was John Burton, who was, um, this legendary California political figure who had been very important in Nancy Pelosi's early day. John Burton's brother, Phil, was head of the Burton political machine. Mm -hmm. And he was quite elderly and not in good health. So one of the first things they did was go to San Francisco to interview him. And then one of the other people I wanted to interview right away was Harry Reid, who, of course, served as Senate leader when Pelosi was serving as house leader for the Democrats and Harry Reid had retired and was suffering from pancreatic cancer. And so one of the early trips I made was to Las Vegas to interview him. And I am happy to report that both these men are still alive and kicking. Yes. So my, my, the urgency I felt to talk to them first turned out to be not warranted, but that was the theory I had. I, I tried to interview I tried to arrange interviews with her, of course, but also with anybody else who had been her friend or her foe or had had encounters with her that I thought would be important. Mm -hmm. And did you talk to her family? I, I talked to the members of the family who would talk to me. Paul Pelosi, her husband, uh, talked to me. That was I was grateful for that. He does very few interviews. I don't think he had done an interview since 2007 with a reporter. Uh, so that was good. I talked to Christine Pelosi, who is her politically minded daughter. Do you know Christine? You're I do know Christine and her her daughter, um, Nancy's granddaughter. Yeah, who's Bella. Quite a Bella is quite a character. Yes. Well, <laughs> there's wonderful. a there's a there are a lot of pictures of Nancy Pelosi with Bella, her granddaughter. So obviously an important 
figure uh, for in, in their lives. Uh, do, do you think Christine will run for her mother's seat if her mother retires? Oh my gosh, um, I don't know, but now you've put it in my head, I'm gonna have to ask her, <laughs> find Good. out. Let me know what she tells you. <laughs> okay, I certainly will, if she doesn't say it confidentially. Um, but is it easier to write a biography the second time? Did you learn things in writing about Barbara Bush that in, in terms of process and procedure that helped you in doing the second one? One thing that was helpful was the first time <clears throat> I wasn't 100% sure I could do it. And having done it once, the second time I knew I could do it. Uh, that was very helpful just in terms of giving me confidence. Also, one thing I discovered in doing the first book was that after I had spent a year interviewing everyone I could think of who knew Barbara Bush and spending time with Barbara Bush herself, I began to trust myself as an authority. You know, when you're a newspaper reporter, you don't say something is true. You say, right. this expert says this is true. Uh, and it took me a long time to realize that at that point, no one knew more about Barbara Bush than I did. And so I might as well trust myself and draw my own conclusions about who she was and why she mattered and what she did. And I started out with that understanding about Nancy Pelosi, that if I did enough research, I would be the authority on Nancy Pelosi mm -hmm. and be able to write with confidence about her life. Was there anyone who refused to talk to you? Yes. Um, you know, unfortunately, in a rare oversight, the founders did not give reporters subpoena power. <laughs> Maybe as a lawyer, you can explain this to me, but it means that people can talk to you or not talk to you. It's up to them. And I, I understand that. I don't blame anybody who didn't want to talk to me. And I'm very appreciative to the people who did talk to me. Yeah, I, I encountered that. I wanted to portray Rosemary Woods as a real person. And I called people who knew her because I wanted to know where did she shop? Who were her friends? What was she like outside the office? And the people who would talk to me knew nothing. Mostly they were men. So I'd say, what did her apartment look like? And they'd go, oh, I, ne I really never noticed. And to people who worked for her uh, in the White House, they would hang up on me. And Bob Woodward said, stop calling. You have to knock on the door. It's harder to slam the door in your face. So I flew to Washington knocked on a door and it was slammed in my face. So I had, I had severe problems there, but um, was the fact that you are a journalist and, and that your, your main job means keeping good relations with newsmakers, uh, did that impact how you went about writing about Nancy? Not so much in gathering the information, but how you would present it. It did not. Uh, you know, I'm, pre I'm pretty elderly now. I'm toward the, <laughs> and so very, therefore I'm not afraid about what people are going to do to me. Um, it's, it's different than when you're a 25 year old reporter desperately trying to develop, develop sources. Um, from the beginning, uh, Nancy Pelosi and everyone I spoke to understood I was doing a report out her life and her influence, the good and the bad. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the book does not say Nancy Pelosi is perfect. She's not perfect. It says she was important. And that's the point of the book. So I approached it just exactly in the way I would have report, uh, approached writing a new story. You know, we'll talk about the person who you so brilliantly portray in your book a little bit uh, later, but I just first want to ask you about you and your career, because as I'm listening to you kind of talk about it, I think it's so important for our audience to get to know you as well, because you have such an interesting life. And, you know, we mentioned at the outset that you um, you got your undergrad and your master's degree in journalism. Um, for all of our young listeners, who many of whom who I know, and they want to become journalists, did you always know you wanted to become a journalist? What was that process like for you to kind of get that first kind of passion for journalism? When I was in high school, there were two things I really loved. And when I was a senior in high school, I had to decide which to do because one was being a journalist, which would take me in one direction. The other, you can guess the other, it's so obvious, it was being an oboist. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I realize it sounds ridiculous now, but I was a very serious oboe player. I played the oboe since I was wow. in the third grade. Um, I went to music camp in the summers. Uh, I played in the state orchestra. Uh, I mean, uh, and I love the oboe, and I do love the oboe even today, although I no longer play it. But you cannot go to one school and both major and double major in oboe and 
journalism. That school does not exist. And you have to make a choice. It's like you do one or the other. And this was honestly an early and difficult decision I made. But once I decided that journalism was the better bet, and believe me, no regrets now, uh, then it was all I wanted to do. I don't recommend just majoring in journalism to people who want to be journalists. But the fact is, there was nothing else I wanted to do. So that's what I majored in. And what was your what was your first job um, as a journalist, like a first official job? So I had some internships when I was in college, but my mm-hmm. first job after I graduated from Columbia was at Newsday, the newspaper on Long Island, where I was the number two reporter for the town of Smithtown. And I thought it was like the best job in the world. Uh, no one covered Smithtown with more energy or focus than I did in that first job. And then I got promoted to Islip, which was a better beat because it was a bigger town. And I became the number one reporter on Islip, not instead of the number two reporter on Smithtown. And then I became a national correspondent for Newsday, moved to Washington for Newsday, and then moved to USA Today. I think that path of starting at the small print publication and then going all the way up is something that I, I'm not sure we quite see enough today, but it's so interesting to hear you talk about that. And now you're obviously at USA Today, which is ranked first in circulation. And w- what is it like to to kind of ha- have had that journey and now as the Washington bureau chief at um, the first ranked uh, circulation newspaper? When I worked for Newsday and was covering Smithtown, it was, I was the number one, it was the number one circulation in Smithtown. It was important <laughs> to the people I was writing about. Um, and, you know, it's not so, it's not so different. When I covered the Smithtown City Council, I had to use the same skills I then used covering the White House. In fact, that's where I learned the skills that you use in covering government and covering its impact on people. Uh, and you also, I think, working for a smaller publication, you see the impact your stories can have on people's lives. It makes you, I think, much more careful about being accurate because you can hurt people in an unfair way if you're inaccurate, but it also shows you kind of the power of journalism to make a difference. So I'm, I am so grateful for the training I got at Newsday. And it's really, it's like, it sounds more prestigious to cover the White House for USA Today, but I can tell you it is essentially the same job as covering city council for Smithtown. I mean, obviously starting there provided you with so many skills and and experiences. And, you know, that brought you to moderating um, the vice presidential debate in 2020 between uh, Mike Pence and Kamala Harris. And for those of us watching, you know, that was kind of in hindsight right now. I mean, that was just such a roller coaster moment throughout (laughs) that election process. And, you know, when you first was when you first got approached to moderate the vice presidential debate, what was your first thought, and what was that like to actually be in that moment? You know, during COVID, there was this huge kind of debacle between whether there should be kind of plexiglass dividers and um, how they should set up the debate. What was that process like for you? It was such a hoot. It was so much fun. Like I was deep, deeply honored, and also just so excited. Uh, it was like a wonderful. It was funny. Frank Farenkopf, the former Republican chairman, who was a member of the debate commission, he's the one who called me and said, would you like to moderate the vice presidential debate? And I said, wow, yes. I didn't have to think about that. And it was especially really funny because a couple years earlier, he and I had had lunch to talk about whatever debate was going on then. And he said, you know, it's too bad you could never moderate a debate because it has to be someone from TV. Uh, the fact is they never had a single moderator be someone who was not a TV journalist. So I was, mm. I was kind of stoked about, about that too. Um, it was, you know, I think these debates are so important. Like we don't have, you know, these candidates do not have to debate. Nothing makes them debate. It's really tradition that pushes them to participate if they don't, even if they don't uh, want to. And it's an occasion when the two candidates for president or for vice president are next to each other on stage, asking questions, not necessarily from a friendly uh, journalist. Uh, I just think they're so important. And that first presidential debate was such a mess. The one with Chris Wallace, not Chris Wallace's fault that Donald Trump blew up that first debate. Uh, So the the vice presidential debate was the second debate. And I did have some real conversations with Chris about how to handle things because the first one had been so difficult. And what you was had, his advice? Yeah. Well, he, he had, he had not come up with what he sh- 
he did not have a plan for what he should have done. He thought he had done what he could, and it was just an impossible situation. Mm -hmm. My debate had its problems, its ups and downs, but I didn't have Donald Trump in it. And Mike Pence was pretty aggressive, more aggressive than I had expected him to be in the debate, but it still was a much easier task than than Chris Wallace said. And I got to tell you, the only thing anyone remembers from my debate is the fly. Yes. <laughs> yes. <yeah. laughs> Did you notice it while, while you were moderating? I couldn't see it. I didn't see the fly. He, obviously, he didn't see it because it was on his head. I understand that Kamala Harris did see it and decided she wouldn't say anything. So I, we, we come off, the debate is over. We go off stage. Um, Pence goes off stage. I follow him a few minutes later. His kids come up. They had been in the audience. And that was when he learned that this big fly had landed on his head <laughs> to everyone's amusement. He and I were both completely unaware of that. Oh, gosh. I, mean, the Biden I campaign. ended up going out to buy a pin that was a fly because how could you not wear a fly? Um, anyway, um, let's go back to your book about Speaker Pelosi and some of your insights. Um, you talk a lot about her upbringing. Uh, her father was a congressman and then the mayor of Baltimore. Her mother was also very active in politics. So it was sort of, she was born into a political family. Um, you describe them as the Kennedys of the West and um, that they were a big influence on her. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Right, the Kennedys of Baltimore, where they right, were the Kennedys from. of Baltimore. Uh, yes, definitely, She's born into political royalty. Uh, politics in her DNA, politics morning, noon and night uh, constituents constantly lining up outside their house in Little Italy, um, seeking help on things that constituents needed help on. Her mother kept what she called a favor file, which was exactly what it sounds like. People would come in and ask for help to get housing or to get a son out of jail or to deal with an immigration problem. And her mother would write on a card what it was that they needed. She would undertake efforts to solve whatever, the, to address whatever problem was they had. Often her daughter, little, who was known as Little Nancy, her mother was called Big Nancy. Little mm -hmm. Nancy would sit next to her mother and take notes about what these people were saying. And of course, when election time came around, the people who had gotten favors were expected to turn out to vote, even to pass out pamphlets to be helpful. And if someone came along later and needed some other favor that a previous favor seeker could provide, that connection would also be made. So this is the essence of politics. This is the essence of what has made Nancy Pelosi such an effective speaker. Interesting to see that. Um, you also write that Nancy said of her mother, um, and I'm quoting from your book, she was constrained not by a lack of imagination, but by the limits of opportunity for women in her day, I often think she was born 50 years too soon. And um, she went on to say that the truth is that my father and the times held her back. Can you talk a little more about that? Because that really struck me as something that reflects my mother's generation as well. I think a common experience for a lot of women of that generation, you know, she was smart and ambitious um, and restless and an entrepreneur. She was a risk taker. She loved the ponies. She was a regular at Pimlico and sometimes was in debt to the bookies. Who could not love this woman? Yes. <laughs> uh, and, it, it, and a fierce partisan. So when her husband was no longer mayor, uh, had retired as mayor, actually had been defeated in his bid for a fourth term. The D'Alessandros continued to live in the house in the Little League where little Nancy had, had grown up. And the White House called in 1984 because President Reagan was coming to Little Italy to, to um, unveil a statue of Christopher Columbus. And they wanted to know if the D'Alessandros wanted to be Reagan's guest at this event. Now, this is obviously the White House thinks this is a huge plum. Who would not want to be the guest of the president for this big event? And Nancy Pelosi's mother said to the White House, after all the things that Ronald Reagan has done to poor people in this country, you better not bring, even bring him close to us. And 
the White House was so concerned by the fierceness of her response that a White House aide actually called the D'Alessandro's son, who had himself served a term as mayor, to ask if she posed a physical threat to the president. (laughs) Oh, that's a great story. And and there are a lot of good stories about the young Nancy, little Nancy. Um, And she ultimately followed a pretty traditional path. She got married at 23, um, raised a large family, and was a volunteer in politics uh, in her early 30s. And it wasn't until like 20 years after that, after her father's death, that she ran for Congress. And I'm wondering if there is a connection between her father's death and her running. And and I ask that particularly because you also mentioned, and you've mentioned um, Congressman Burton, but um, his wife and Lindy Boggs were two women who became members of Congress after their husbands had passed away. Um, and did Burton and Boggs play a role as well as her father? So I don't think it was the passing away of her father, the illness of her father at the time of the campaign that made a difference. I think what made a difference, and this is something we see a lot with women of her generation who get into politics. She didn't think she could get into politics until another woman told her to do it, encouraged her to do it. And in this case, it was Sally Burton, who, as you said, was the widow of Phil Burton, uh, leader of a you know very well known uh, politician, uh, pro, you know there's a wonderful book about him called A Rage for Justice hmm. uh, by John Jacobs. It is a great political biography. Uh, Sally Burton succeeded her husband as the congresswoman from uh, San Francisco, and she was then dying of cancer. And she called Nancy Pelosi into her to her hospital room, and said. I think you should run for my seat. Mm. And if you do, I will endorse you, which was a huge prize because Nancy Pelosi had never run for anything before. It was San Francisco. You knew there was going to be a lot of people running for the seat. This was an important endorsement. Nancy Pelosi, then had four of her children uh, had were in college or out working. Her youngest daughter was a senior in high school. And she went back and asked her daughter, Alexandra, if it would be okay with Alexandra if she ran for this office, because if she won, she would be spending time in Washington, not with Alexandra. And Alexandra said, mom, get a life. (laughs) (laughs) It's the scorn of our children. Uh, We're less important to them perhaps than we think we are. And with that, Nancy Pelosi ran, narrowly won that first special election and has never lost another election. Wow. Wow. Um, now, because we mentioned Lindy Boggs, who did take over uh, also when her husband was killed in a, a plane crash, um, and it seems to me that back then that was not an uncommon. You know, it's interesting that it was a, it took a woman to ask Nancy, or a woman taking over for the husband, and then getting. Of course, Lindy became quite powerful and was elected in her own right. Um, but I wonder if that was a more common way for women to enter politics back then. It absolutely was. And sometimes women served only the remainder of their husband's term after he died. And sometimes they ended up with big political careers of their own as Lindy Boggs did. Lindy Boggs actually one of the, an important mentor for Nancy Pelosi, uh, even before she was in Congress, when she was a political organizer uh, in California politics, she got a, a big job uh, on a committee at a convention. And she went to Lindy Boggs, who was a friend, and said, you know, I think I'll give up this other political job because I'm getting this new political job. And Lindy Boggs said, no man would ever do that. Don't yeah. give up anything. Lindy Boggs told her, Nancy, know thy power. And when mm-hmm. Pelosi wrote her memoir, she titled it, Know Your Power. Uh-huh. A hat tip to Lindy Boggs. You know, I just have to mention, Lindy Boggs was the chair of the convention in 1976, and I was the consul to the convention. So I got to meet her and work with her and several others on ERA, which was a big issue back then. She was a phenomena. She really was fabulous. But um, let's let's talk a little more about sexism, and, and I think Victor has some questions on that. Yeah, I mean, your your book describes sexism as this big force that loomed large when Speaker Pelosi first got involved in politics. And 
Interestingly enough, you wrote that Speaker Pelosi avoided that topic of sexism when she was running for office. Can you explain that for our audience and, and why that was? Pelosi complained about sexism only once in one race, and that was the only race she ever lost. It was a bid to become Democratic chair, National Democratic chair, after the Walter Mondale debacle mm -hmm. uh, in 1984. Walter Mondale, who, of course, just passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we honor his memory. Um, Pelosi ran for that job, and she thought she was the best. She thought she was clearly the best candidate. She was from the West where the where the party needed to go. She had a proven record in California as the political organizer. And she lost a race that big labor had a different candidate, Paul Kirk Jr., and spread all these slurs about sexist slurs about Pelosi, mm -hmm. calling her an airhead and a female airhead and a dilettante, all things that Nancy Pelosi was not. Uh, and in the after that race, she complained kind of bitterly that they had done this, that they had waged the sexist campaign. But after that, she never complained about it again. And I think that she just decided there was no point in complaining about it. She would just plow ahead. The fact is, Nancy Pelosi has one gear, and that is full speed ahead. And I think she then just put on blinders and ignored some of the sexism that she faced during the rest of her political career mm -hmm. and, and faces today, you know, some of the attack, Nancy Pelosi is the, uh, is endlessly attacked by Republicans, some of them for ideological reasons, but a lot of it is just misogyny. Uh, and that continues to be a factor today. You describe Nancy as, you know, wanting more influence as a member of Congress. And obviously, you know, she, you, you describe her as wanting to go, you know, just full plow ahead. Did she always have her eyes set on that speaker role? She says no. Um, but she was almost immediately seen as a contender. And Chuck Schumer said so there was a Tuesday night dinner group of some young members of Congress, uh, some members, of, young members of the House, and she joined this uh, dinner group when she arrived in Congress in 1987. There was Barbara Boxer, there was Chuck Schumer, uh, Dick Durbin, any number of people who went on to have bigger political careers. And when I interviewed Chuck Schumer for the book, he said that uh, that George Miller, who was a California congressman who first brought Nancy Pelosi to this dinner, said to him, oh, you're going to meet Nancy Pelosi tonight. She's a future speaker. Wow. So there were those who saw these skills in her, but it took a while um, and it took a t her getting unhappy with the Democratic leadership in place for her to then challenge the old boy network and get her foot on the ladder. So from another perspective, you write wonderfully about how after Dick Gephardt resigned as minority leader um, in the House to run in the 2004 presidential primaries, Speaker Pelosi was elected to replace him. Uh, well, now Speaker Pelosi was elected to replace him, making her the first woman to lead the Democratic Party in the House. Was that a powerful experience for her? Did that open the doors for more to come? Yeah, the first woman to be leader of Democrats in the House, the first woman to lead either party in either chamber. Uh, it's, it was really a grand, and she continues to be the only woman who has been the leader of either, either party in either chamber. Uh, it, was a, it was a very powerful, it, it was a big step uh, and it wasn't that long ago, isn't it remarkable that yes. that's she, and she when she went to the she went to the first White House meeting as when she after she was elected to the leadership the first time she had been included in that traditional meeting between the president and the congressional leaders, and she, you know she she had this experience which sounds mystical. She describes it as concrete, where she suddenly felt crowded in her chair by suffragette suffragette leaders that she felt they were all around her and with her, she was, you know, representing them. And that after a minute or two, that feeling went away. Isn't that interesting? That is very interesting. Um, another part of your book, you paint a very vivid picture of Nancy Pelosi as a leader and how she wields her power. Um, you describe her as an iron fist in a Gucci glove. And, and it seems like with her political background, 
but I wonder if her style as speaker came to her naturally, whether it was something she had to force herself to learn, whether she watched it in her father and her mother and it just was natural. What do you, what do you think? When I was writing this book, this is a slightly circular answer, but when I was writing, when I signed the contract for the book, the title of the book was Nancy Pelosi and the Ark of Power. And then I got about halfway through and I changed it to Nancy Pelosi and the Tests of Power. But by the end of it, I made it Nancy Pelosi and the Lessons of Power because she so reflects the lessons she learned from the day she was born into that political household in Baltimore. Uh, I think her leadership, I'm sure her leadership style has evolved some over the years, but I think it's pretty natural to her. I think this is who Nancy Pelosi is. Uh, I think this is the the skills uh, and, and the strengths and the weaknesses that she brings to her job. The phrase Iron Fist in a Gucci glove, which I love and use in the book, was actually coined by John Bresnahan, who was then working for Politico. He used it in a profile of her about a decade ago. And that's the combination that has made her able to re be elected leader of House Democrats, stay in power longer than anybody since Sam Rayburn, and wield power because she can have a Gucci glove. She can understand where members are coming from figure out what motivates them, how to bring them along. But when she needs it, she has an iron fist. I mean, it's such a powerful book also for young people to kind of learn how someone as influential as Speaker Pelosi is able to wield that power when it matters. And one of the most, I guess, vivid stories that you tell in the book about her wielding power is um, her first few months in office. And, you know, she, she didn't re really receive the backing of a lot of people. And in 2009, she hovered at just over 10% approval rating. And I, I, did the, per, the, I guess, did the public's perception of Speaker Pelosi ever affect how she approached her job and um, how she approached decision making? She's always been controversial. Um, she's never had a great approval rating. She's very popular among partisan Democrats, but she is really vilified uh, by Republicans. I don't think it has, I don't think that has been, has prompted her to change the way she does business. Here's, here's the fact. Nancy Pelosi is terrible at the things we can all see, at big speeches, at impromptu exchanges, at news conferences. And Nancy Pelosi is fantastic, unsurpassed at the things we don't see, like negotiations in a closed room or convincing a single crucial member of Congress to cast a vote that he or she does not want to cast. So it is not surprising that her public perception has often been pretty toxic because her strength is really not with the larger American public. It's with the 225 members, Democratic members of the House. So, you know, throughout the book, you underscore how masterful Speaker Pelosi is in specifically counting the votes or whipping the votes. And you share, you know, the Affordable Care Act and other stories. I mean, is there an example that you think stands out about her being able to whip the votes that you can share with our audience? And also kind of the importance of that skill and then how well she's able to do it compared to other speakers and what about that skill makes her effective? Here's an example of what, how she's skilled with that. The Affordable Care Act, uh, passed very narrowly in the House. Passage was not assured. Uh, John Donnelly was a member of the House from Indiana. They wanted his vote. He had voted against the Affordable Care Act the first time around. President Obama calls Congressman Donnelly into, his, into the Oval Office and says, I need you to do this for me. This did not persuade John Donnelly that he was going to vote for it. He wasn't going to do it for Obama. Um, Nancy Pelosi did something different. She didn't lobby Donnelly herself. She called Father Theodore Hesburgh, who was the head of Notre Dame, where Joe Donnelly had gone to school. Uh, father Hesburgh was like a father to him. And Donnelly called, uh, Hesburgh called Donnelly and said, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I know that you're going to do the right thing. And Joe Donnelly decided, well, the right thing, I guess the right thing is to vote for this. Wow. And he voted for it. That is good strategy on her part. That's for sure. Um, when, when the Democrats lost seats in the midterms in 2010, uh, Nancy became the minority leader. 
how did she handle her loss of power? Because that's a, a much less uh, influential position than being speaker. And she was partly responsible, right? Mm -hmm. If you're the leader, you 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 prosper when times are good, but you're held responsible. You're blamed when times are bad. Uh, she seriously thought about stepping down. Uh, she was quite discouraged. She thought that uh, she thought that President Obama could have done more to protect House Democrats in that midterm election. I think other others, even fans of President Obama, would agree with that assessment. She went back to California to think about what to do, and word got around, it wasn't widely known, but among some of her key allies, words got around that she was seriously thinking about stepping down. And some of them began to call her. Uh, Richard Trumpka, the head of the AFL-CIO, heard that she was thinking about this. He told me that he called her and said, nobody can do what you can do. It's important that you not step down. And others gave her the same message. And she then went around and consulted with almost every Democrat in the House about whether they wanted her to step down. And in the end, perhaps, uh, you know, in, in the end, she decided to stay. Uh, and we gaining control of the House, of course, took a long time. It took eight mm -hmm. years before Democrats would be back in control again. That is a long time to be in the minority. And how did she approach working with the new speakers in the time as minority leader? The speakers that she worked with thought that she was tough. You know, she was, she was aiming to win elections. I mean, uh, uh, John Boehner, um, who was the speaker who succeeded her as speaker, he served as speaker between her two stints as, as speaker, um, said that... Uh, said that even when he wanted to moderate his rhetoric, she never did. And Newt Gingrich, she had a terrible relationship with Newt Gingrich. She's, you know, she's a partisan figure. She wanted to regain control. She wasn't a Bob Michael who maybe would be uh, happy in the, apparently happy in the minority and willing to be cooperative. And that, that's not the era we're in either. You know, we're in a different kind of era these days. So I think her number one focus uh, when she was in the minority was, number one, prevent bad things from happening, bad things in her view, things Republicans might try to do. And number two, get power back. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so let's talk about something that is endlessly fascinating, and that is her relationship with Donald Trump. Um, I mean, news photos and stories show, in my mind anyway, Speaker Pelosi and Trump as not getting along at all. Uh, how did the speaker see it in, in, you know, from her perspective and also from your perspective as a journalist and as her biographer? Um, was that public perception, is my public perception anyway, uh, a valid one? Nancy Pelosi had a pretty negative view of Donald Trump from the start. I mean, she had she had been thinking about and making plans to step down in 2016 after Hillary Clinton was inaugurated, assuming Hillary Clinton would be inaugurated, as so many of us did assume. It was only when she real on election night in 2016, when she realized that Trump was elect, being elected president, that she decided to stick around uh, and stand up to him. She had she saw him as um, his, she didn't like his attitude toward women. Uh, she didn't like the the Access Hollywood tape. Uh, she didn't like his rhetoric on immigration, immigration being a very important issue to her, one that had affected her family. Her grandparents had immigrated from, from Italy. Uh, so she was determined to prevent Trump from doing bad th things and to get power back to stand up to him. Now, Trump's attitude, Trump had a, a slightly different attitude toward Pelosi, I think, Trump saw Pelosi as someone, as the fellow deal maker, and maybe someone he could do business with. And in fact, I interviewed Trump for USA Today uh, in the fall of 2018, just a few weeks before the midterm elections in 2018. And he was, in fact, not that concerned about Democrats regaining control, mm -hmm. making Pelosi speaker, because he thought there, and he said, in some ways, they'll be more interested in getting things done than the Republicans are. And there were aides to him, including Steve Bannon, who were telling him, this will be catastrophic for you if Democrats win control of the House. Steve Bannon told me he thought Pelosi was determined to impeach Trump from the start, and then she would be able to do it. 
that was not Trump's view, although, of course, it, as it turned out, it was not a good thing for Donald Trump when Nancy Pelosi became Speaker of the House. I, I, he clearly misperceived that. Um, uh, there's also been some discussion, and, and you talk about this in the book, about Speaker Pelosi uh, being criticized by Republicans and some Democrats as not being willing to work with Trump. Of course, I see it as Trump wasn't willing to work with anything the Democrats wanted. But um, did she see this? And of course, there's the famous thing at the State of the Union where she tore up his speech as the way of um, maybe communicating with him and, and her famous clap. Um, did she see this as a way to communicate with him? Did she see herself as not working with him or as doing the best anybody could possibly do? Because she was a deal maker. I think she lost her temper <laughs> at the 2020 State of the Union. She yeah. she told me that she she that she was up there sitting behind Trump. When the president arrived, he gave her a text of the State of the Union, which is customary. She was reading through it. She saw something she thought was wrong, untrue. And she wanted to just make a little mark on the paper so she could come back to that. And she couldn't find a pen because, of course, when you're the Speaker of the House, you do not take your purse up with you to the dais on the State of the Union. And there's a little drawer there in front of her. So she opens the drawer. There's nothing in the drawer. There's no pen. So she made a tiny tear in the margin of the paper just so she could find this thing that she wanted to refer back to. And then she found another thing she thought wasn't true, and she made another tiny tear. And then she found something else she thought wasn't true, and she made another tiny tear. And she told me that she didn't really decide to tear it up until the very end. And by the end of it, she was steaming, for one thing, because of the honor, the presidential honor that Trump had awarded to Rush Limbaugh at this State of the Union address. She thought that is an inappropriate thing to do at that event. So she's pretty mad. She said he was going to, I decided if he was going to shred the truth, I was going to shred his speech. So she stands up. I've never seen anything like this in all my years in Washington, tears the speech in half four times she had to she had to do a few pages at a time because it was so thick four times tearing it in half tossing it with contempt clear contempt onto the desk meanwhile mike pence is standing next to her clapping for the president pretending he doesn't see a thing <laughs> it, it is a memorable scene um, one last question about this which is how is she dealing with the divisions within the Democratic Party and the total polarization of Democrats and Republicans um, and dealing with Republicans right now, particularly after the January 6th insurrection? Yeah. There, she doesn't have much relationship with Republicans. There is, I, I think it is fair, which Nancy Pelosi didn't create our polarization, but she hasn't done much to ameliorate it either. She is a pretty fierce partisan uh, who is comfortable navigating this current political landscape. Uh, and that's why we have Democrats using things like reconciliation to get the big proposals through. It's tough. You know, she, she now has a five seat margin in the House. That's the narrowest majority either party has had in modern times in the House. She can only lose two or three votes and get the, anything through the House. Uh, and she has a caucus that's divided. You've got AOC and members of the squad in that caucus, and you've got Abigail Spanberger and other members who were elected in districts that were run, won by Donald Trump. Uh, she has, though, managed to hold them together pretty well. Uh, maybe the narrowness of their majority means that nobody feels free to really take a flyer, but it is a political task. Well, you know, your book shares so many amazing stories about Speaker Pelosi. And obviously, we can't get to them all uh, during this podcast. But, you know, your book makes clear Speaker Pelosi is one of the most looked up to women in America. And you also mentioned during this podcast as well, and also in the book that she's this deeply polarizing and controversial figure, and that many people don't understand her. You know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, what do you think her legacy will be as, you know, students my age, or, you know, other, other, you know, young people look back on her um, career and her time as Speaker? A lot of people think Nancy Pelosi would be in the history books because she was the first woman speaker. She was the most powerful woman in American history, and that's true. But I think if Nancy Pelosi were male, 
she would still be in the history books for the legislation that she pushed through mm -hmm. at a difficult time, the Affordable Care Act, uh, the financial rescue package. Uh, she has been at the center of the biggest events in our country in the 21st century. She was the ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee at 9-11. She was the most senior member of Congress to oppose the Iraq war from the start. She pushed through the financial rescue package. She was responsible for passage of the Affordable Care Act and then, at the point she was thinking about retiring, she became the Democratic face of the opposition to the most disruptive president in our history. That's someone who's going to be in the history books for any number of reasons. Wow, that might be a good place to end our talk, but I just want to ask a few more questions. Um, do you think she will run for another term? I don't think so. I don't, I don't say that with confidence. Uh, she hasn't made a Sherman-esque kind of statement, but when she was elected speaker in 2018, she made a commitment that she would only serve two more terms. Mm -hmm. It wasn't written into the rules. You're not, you can't arrest her if she doesn't do that. But she indicated this year that she remembered that commitment and was likely to pay attention to it. So I think this is a natural time for her to step down. She'll have had two years with the Biden presidency. That's going to be the probably the best time to get big legislation through. She's 81 years old, any place but Congress, that would be retiring age. Yes. So who do you think is best positioned to replace her? I'm sure there'll be a fight, uh, but the names that are considered most likely, Hakeem Jeffries from New York, in the leadership now, close to Pelosi, he would be a groundbreaker. He would be, if elected, the first person of color to lead a party in one of the chambers of Congress. There are a couple other names. Adam Schiff would like, I think, to run for the leadership. Karen Bass, also from California. She would be a groundbreaker, too, as an African-American woman and a former speaker of the California House. Uh, there, One of the things, I think that if you look at the people who have the, like, Nancy Pelosi seal of approval among the next generation, look at the people she named to be impeachment managers yes. the first time mm -hmm. Trump was impeached. That was a huge job, an important job, an historic place. She named Hakeem Jeffries, Adam Schiff as, a, as the top manager, Val Demings. Her decision to put Val Demings, the congresswoman from Florida on it, made her a contender for Biden's vice president. Uh, Jason Crow, a congressman from Colorado, who actually opposed her as speaker, but now they've become friends. These are the people I think she sees as rising to leadership positions down the road. And the three you specifically named are all really good public speakers. So when you talked about her in the beginning, you said that's not her strength, is she's more the behind the scenes whipping person. Uh, but Hakeem Jeffries is a phenomenal speaker, as are the others. So that's very interesting. Well, you know, speaker, each speaker, each congressional leader, each leader, not even just in Congress, they've got their own styles. They've got their own strengths and weaknesses. The next speaker will not be like Nancy Pelosi, but they should hope to be as effective as Nancy Pelosi has been. Yeah. Um, so one last question. Um, we always like to end with kind of getting to know um, or any advice that our guests would have for younger people. And, you know, for you to be such a prolific author and also such a um, fierce reporter at the USA Today, what advice do you have for younger students who are getting involved in journalism who may be you know, looking at a possible career path in journalism? Well, the advice I've generally given is just say yes. You get an opportunity, just say yes. I think this is something that... Um, women in particular sometimes have problems doing. Somebody offers you a job and you think you're not the best qualified person, just say yes, just do it. You're, it's, it's something you think is terrifying. You know, what's the worst thing that can happen? You'll just try it and you'll fail. Then you'll pick yourself back up and you'll have learned something. Uh, so that is, I've taken several jobs I thought I wasn't entirely qualified to fill and it's worked out okay. So just do it. Mm -hmm. And do you have any more books planned? I want to do a book. I want to do a third book, but I do not have a topic. What do you think? Shall I do it about Jill? <laughs> Pretty formidable woman. That would be so much fun, but I think um, we need someone else. I don't know. Well, I'm in, I'm in market for ideas, so feel free to pass them along. Okay. I'm going to give that some thought. Yeah. Um, some important things. This was an absolutely 
fantastic conversation. I am so grateful and so lucky to, to be able to call you a friend and to have this kind of quality on our show. We appreciate it enormously. And we hope that everyone listening or watching will go out and buy both of her books. Yes, this one as well. All right, thank you so much, Susan. Hey, thank you. It's been my uh, pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.